Good evening. Thanks for joining us as we get ready to broadcast the second of four debates in the election for Seattle City Council. I'm Brian Jackson. Tonight's debate will cover special different topics ranging from gun violence to policing, homelessness, and affordable housing. There are two candidates vying for the council seat that will be vacated by council member Shama Swant, who's been in her seat for the last nine years. There's Joy Hollingsworth from the Central District. She works for the nonprofit Northwest Harvest and Alex Hudson from First Hill, the former executive director of the nonprofit Transportation Choices Coalition. District 3 covers the Central District, Capitol Hill, Madison Park, Lashai, and Montlake. Fox 13 will be bringing you all four of the debates, and don't forget, if you miss any of them, you can find them on the Fox 13 local connected TV app. And now here are the moderators for District 3's debate, including Fox 13's very own Hannah Kim. From the Broadway Performance Hall at Seattle Central College, good evening and welcome to the debate between candidates who want to represent you, District 3, on the Seattle City Council. I'm Greg Copeland with King 5. I'm Hannah Kim with Fox 13. And I'm Cesar Canizales with Converge Media. This debate has been organized by the Seattle City Club, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Seattle City Club is dedicated to improving the civic health of the Puget Sound region and to providing voter access to those who hold and seek political office. We want to first thank our sponsors, Comcast, GSPA, Puget Sound Energy, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, and our hosts, the Seattle Colleges. Thanks to our media partners and our production partner, PNTA. And anyone watching this tonight can be part of the conversation on social media by using the hashtag S-E-A-E-L-E-X-C-L-X. -E -E and also, we want to thank everyone. A special thank you for the live audience tonight. They've agreed to no cheers, no boos, and to hold your applause until the end of the debate, except for right now when we want to introduce you to tonight's candidates. That is Joy Hollingsworth. <laughs> Thank you. And we also have Alex Hudson. Thank you, too, for both being here. So let's lay out the format for tonight's debate. And I do want to reiterate the applause. Please hold it for the end. It will be very tempting to applaud after each um, response from the candidates, but please let's hold that to the very end. I will actually prompt you at the end when we're all done. It just speeds things up and keeps it a more interesting contest. All right, each candidate will have 90 seconds for an opening statement. Questions will then be asked to both candidates. They will have one minute for that initial response to the question. Our panel will then lead some follow-up discussion on that topic before moving on to the next question. So with that, let's get started. We did flip a coin backstage, and Alex, I know you won but deferred, so Joy, uh, you will have the opening statement. You may begin. Hey, well, good evening. I want to definitely thank um, the Seattle City Club, the GSBA, and then on the beautiful campus of Seattle Colleges. It's home to 45,000 students, 130 workforce programs, and they have been serving our community since 1970. And so that's, that's phenomenal. My name is Joy Hollingsworth, and I'm running for Seattle City Council, District 3. I'm a nonprofit leader, small business owner, community connector, and a problem solver. And I'm a third generation Seattleite. And I got into this race because our response to public safety, our response to homelessness, the affordability crisis that we've seen going on in our city, also our infrastructure. And most importantly, what I've seen on our streets is our youth, how they're severely neglected. And the light bulb moment for me was understanding how all of those interconnect. And as we have now transitioned from that sleepy city into that teenager phase of a city, what type of home do we want to build for our community? What type of adult do you want to be for our working class families, for our teachers, our educators, our artists, our, our community? Because we have been hyper-focused about building a city, and I believe our challenge today is how we build a home. And I'm looking forward to answering the questions tonight, and I hope to earn your vote. Thank you. Alex, before you talk, I, wanted, I have 20 seconds here I wanted to use really quickly. I know you will be both addressing the camera, um, it's hard to make out these lights. The green one will be, you're still good to go. Yellow's getting down there. And the red, I'll be leaning on that, but I will try to cut you off. So I know it's hard to focus on that. I may try to get your attention that way. Alex, you may go. 
Yeah, great, thank you. It's an honor to be here. My name is Alex Hudson, and I have the honor and privilege of being a candidate for Seattle City Council here in the beautiful District 3. I'm a mom and a renter and a transit rider, and I'm a progressive leader with a long track record of results. I was born here in King County, and because of my dad's good union job, got to be the first person in my family to go to college. And I worked my way through, and the year that I graduated, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And because I didn't have health insurance, Medicaid stepped up and saved my life, which means that good government programs and the people who fought for them are the reason I'm here today. And that experience is what made, led me to dedicate my life to public service, which is what I've done for well over a decade. For five years, I was the executive director of First Hills Neighborhood Organization, where we built, helped to build affordable housing and site homeless shelters. I ran an organization that made public transit free for every kid in Washington. And I know that things in Seattle feel really tough right now. But hard is not the same thing as impossible, and it is within our ability to create the thriving, safe Seattle where everyone has a safe, affordable place to sleep. No one has to sleep on our streets. We take care of people, and we have thriving, wonderful communities. It's only possible with effective leadership in City Hall. Thank you very much. And as a side note, I appreciate that both of you came out through talking about yourselves and not the other person. Let's get right into this. There are a lot of big topics to handle. There are a lot of uh, smaller, very specific topics that we want to handle tonight as well. Um, a recent Crosscut Elway poll asked Seattle voters which issues are the most important as they decide to vote in the next city council election. By far, homelessness was number one, as you might imagine. Uh, that was followed by crime and affordable housing, but we're going to begin with homelessness. The 2022 point in time count found more than 13,000 people experiencing homelessness. That's in King County and Seattle uh, as well. That's a 5% increase from 2020. This year, the city budgeted $153.7 million to fight that crisis. The question before you, do you think that money is being well spent? What would you do differently? Yeah, homelessness is a severe crisis. It's a moral crisis, and it stops us from living our full potential here in the city of Seattle. And there are few things that could be more important than ensuring that everyone has a safe, affordable place to live. We are investing quite a bit in this issue. Of course we are. It is an enormous one. But we need to get closer to the root causes of homelessness and the actual solutions at scale. We need to be doing things like standing up shelters immediately. We need transitional housing and hotels and tiny houses. And we need the programs that are able to connect with people, build trust, and get people. take time. But it is possible with services, investments, and programs to get a handle on this issue and be better close to living our, our values and what we want to see and accept in our streets. Joy? Yeah, so in 2013, we spent $30 million on uh, homelessness, and now we're at $157 million. We've seen the increase of homelessness spending. We've also seen the in increase of on our streets. Uh, the one thing that we have not increased are shelter beds. And so the first thing is we talk about homelessness, we have to split it apart. You have four parts. It's an affordable housing issue. We also have a mental health crisis on our street. We also have a drug disorder on our streets that we see, and we also have a group of vulnerable people preying on, on folks. And so if we can pull it apart, and that's a public safety issue and address that, we have to have more emergency shelters, RV car lots, day centers, uh, for people to be able to go connect to resources. We also need more emergency shelters as well. We also have to have this place where people can be able to go get treatment for uh, the fentanyl crisis that we see on our streets, and then also the mental health uh, that we see as well. So it's, we have to split it in four parts and attack it in different ways. All right. Please, uh, please hold your applause for the end. I know it's tempting. Uh, Joy, this one right back at you. Um, several studies show a lack of affordable housing. Obviously, we're going to talk about that more in depth. Among the top contributors to homelessness, a report from the State Department of Commerce earlier this year said that King County will need to build roughly 17,000 units per year over the next 20 years just to keep up with the population growth, nothing else. Where should those be built in Seattle or in District 3 and why? 
Yeah, look, District 3, we've seen an uh, increase. We live in one of the most dense places um, in our, our city. And when affordability got difficult for our family, uh, we bought our, my grandmother bought our home in 1947. We turned our house into a triplex back in 2001, uh, where she was able to age in place as we saw our neighborhood changing and getting more unaffordable. And so a couple ways in which we can attack this, we can streamline uh, our building process for permits. It took us three months to get a building permit. You'd be hard pressed for a year or two years to get permits in our city. So we have to streamline our building process. The second piece is that we have to build more family housing. We have to, we have built a lot of single, um, uh, single rooms, a lot of studios, but we have to be a city that's more welcoming to young families, and we have to build more city for more family housing as well. So any type of housing is 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 needed, and then duplexes, triplexes, ADUs, all the people that are trying to age in place to being add to density into their neighborhoods. We should be welcoming that to streamline that process. Alex. Yeah, I am a renter myself, and so I know how important this issue of affordability is, and how much. It is becoming harder and harder to make your paycheck uh, take you through the month after you pay your rent. I'm on the board of one of the largest affordable housing providers in King County, and so I've spent years working on this issue, organizing my community to help to build one of the largest affordable housing uh, projects completed in Seattle in the last 60 years. It's got 350 units of housing. And I live in one of the densest places in Seattle. But I know that our comprehensive plan is going to call for us to add more housing in more places, and we need to be able to do that faster, cheaper, and easier. There are things like streamlining our permitting. We've been doing like Portland does and bringing it all under one roof or like Auburn and creating an ombudsman program. We need to invest in deep affordability. We need to uh, increase the supply and we need to do this very quickly so that everyone can have a safe, affordable place to live. I'm going to go back at both of you. Alex, I'm going to start with you. You both answered part of the question, but we didn't get very specific. And I think when people start thinking about District 3 specifically, it's very diverse, uh, much different up north than it is down south. You have lots of different styles of neighborhoods. Building, building um, more affordable housing in one of those areas is going to get more pushback than others. How do you build affordable housing in, say, a Montlake and tell the people who are there who have their uh, maybe a nice home and don't want to see a multi-family house or a unit come in. How do you tell them that's just the way it is? It has to go there. We have to find place uh, to build these homes. Alex, that's for you. Yeah, uh, people in Montlake are feeling this squeeze just, you know, just like everyone. This issue around affordability has come home for us all. Um, right now, the state legislature passed a bill last year that says that every single family, formerly single family zone, has up to three units of housing in it. So we've already made some pretty significant changes here. One way we can help is to create automatic templates of housing, like how you used to buy a house out of the Sears robot catalog. We can work with our architecture and history departments to create templates of multifamily housing that are beautiful, reflect our history, look like our architecture, and so that and, and that come with a very fast permit. This is an easy way to create beautiful housing um, quickly. Joy? Yeah, so some of those neighborhoods you're talking about, whether it's Montlake, you, Madrona, a lot of those neighborhoods are thinking about affordability because they do not have, uh, their property taxes are going up. These are middle class folks who, you know, are trying to make ends meet and they are slipping down lower and lower um, into, you know, where it's being really hard. They're getting squeezed. And so they're asking me about, hey, how can I be able to put an ADU in my backyard? How can I be able to turn my house into a triplex or duplex? These are people that are wanting to do that to create affordability for our city. And I think we need to embrace that and, and encourage that. We'll talk about some more of the specifics here in, in a little bit because it obviously all gets intertwined. Uh, we do want to pivot. Um, this discussion a bit. Well, a pressing concern that has captured the attention of Seattleites and igni ignited um, some pretty passionate debates is the state of public safety in our city. Hannah Kim uh, now has some questions for you about that. Okay. So on a scale from 1 to 10, what is your opinion about the severity of crime? And again, opinion about the severity of crime in Seattle, 1 being the least safe and 10 being the most safe. Alex. 
feel like that kind of depends on the day. It's clear and obvious to all of us that we are not on track on this issue. There is far too much disorder in our streets. There's far too much suffering and misery in our streets, and it's affecting all of us. Everybody wants solutions to this, and we know what they are. We can increase public safety in our district with effective solutions that are built on our progressive values. If we make sure that everyone can come inside, we create the addiction health hubs that are necessary to connect people who are suffering with addiction to save their lives and get them connected to the support that they need and deserve. And if we ensure that we have enough mental health uh, and residential care facilities for people who are truly ill to come inside. If we are able to do that as well as stand up a meaningful uh, and impactful and effective, effective uh, alternative response to our police officers, we will ensure that if you need help or you see somebody who needs help, there's always someone who will show up and be able to do something about it. So from one being least safe and 10 being most safe, I know you said it depends on the day, <laughs> but I do want to get your opinion and I think it's important because like you said, crime is sometimes perspective, how you feel and how you, you know, feel during that day. So when you're walking around Seattle, you said you're a mom, you know, you use transit, how do you feel from one to 10? Do you feel moderately safe? Do you not feel safe? Where are you on public safety? Yeah, I feel sad and disappointed. I oftentimes feel afraid. I would love to be able to send my kid to the park without a second thought or to not have her come home after, uh, after you know, coming home from school with some story about, you know, something that shouldn't happen. So this is, uh, I feel this issue as much as anyone and uh, it's clearly affecting everyone. I also have plenty of lovely experiences here in our beautiful district, uh, and I know that that, that doesn't excuse uh, the things that do happen, but it is it is a lovely place. So you don't want to pick a number? Okay. Joy, go ahead. Yeah, I'm at a 10. Um, it, you know, it, it, it depends where... Let's hold the applause. Please, please. It, it really depends. Look, public safety... Whether we understand it consciously or subconsciously, it affects us. What time you're going to the grocery store, where you park in your car, you're circling the blocks two, two times to figure out where you're parking it, where you're walking down the street. I don't have to fear monger here. This is what we're experiencing right now. And if you're in Southeast Seattle, which is 12% of the population, but it's over 38% of the gun violence going on in our city, you're not feeling safe right now. Or if you're in the Central District and we're experiencing what we have been with the gun violence going on and the, the, the activity on our streets, you're not feeling safe. And so, you know, I support the mayor's plan for 1,400 police officers. And in addition to gun violence prevention programs, understanding that we have to have our, our health one with our fire department, ensuring that they're um, being safe out into the encampments that they're going in, connecting people to resources as well. Um, also, you know, ensuring that our kids have something to do as well um, and, and keep, keeping everyone safe. So I do want to clarify, I think you meant to say one being the least safe and 10 being the most safe. I wanted to get that on the record, Joy. Thank you. Yes. I'm at a one. <laughs> Just want to make sure. I wanted to make sure on that. Thank you for that answer. And so I want to specifically zone in on Capitol Hill. When you look at the number as of September of this year, you had 1,613 cases of crime, and that's both violent and property crime in Capitol Hill alone. And what would be interesting to District 3 is that that is actually higher. It's the highest number of cases. It's even more than downtown Seattle right now. So what would you do specifically in the Capitol Hill area Area that would make people safer, Alex. Yeah, you know, one of the things about Capitol Hill is this is home to the East Precinct, and so our police officers are right here in this neighborhood, and, and we are still seeing these rates of crime. So we need to ask ourselves, what are the fuller and better solutions to make sure that, uh, that we have a lovely a place that reaches its full potential? And we know what those effective solutions are. We need mental and behavioral health centers so that people who are very sick in our streets and who are causing uh, a lot 
lot of disruption, have somewhere that they can go and get the treatment that they need so that they can get better, not just this cruel cycle that keeps continuing. We need to be investing in our small businesses and making sure that they have the resources that they need in order to address some of the issues that are going on. We need to build more housing for folks. We can have things like they have in the university district where they have neighborhood ambassadors. We can increase the lighting and um, increase through um, SEPTED, which is uh, safety through environmental design. There's a lot of work that we can do on this issue. Okay, thank you. Joy? Yeah, look, uh, one of the places, specifically Cal Anderson Park, uh, has to have better lighting. Um, you know, that, that place has become, um, unfortunately, uh, at night, a place where, you know, a lot of activity has happened. Um, we do have an East Precinct, uh, but at any point in time, they have 12 officers, and they ride in units of, of cars, double pairs, so it's six, six units out there. If they're all responding to a priority one call, which is like the, unfortunately, the car that ran through one of the retail shops here on Capitol Hill through the front door. Um, you know, all of them are at that one place, and so there's other places they cannot respond to. Um, and so we're talking about lighting, we're talking about creating like these safe environments, lowering our response time, our Health One Department, which we have our fire department here on Capitol Hill, which is one of the most busiest fire departments um, responding to different stuff, whether it's overdoses, whether it's, um, you know, connecting with neighbors and connecting with resources. We have to ensure that they have a lot of the resources that they need to respond to that as well. So specifically in Capitol Hill, we're talking about Health One, fire department, and ensuring that we have a uh, low response time for our department. Teen violence is in the news almost every day now, from carjackings to armed robberies to even murder. So what new policies would you implement to address teens committing the most violent crimes in our community? And Joy? Yeah, it's the fact that we have uh, middle school kids and teens doing a lot of the activity on the street is literally a failure on us as a society and as adults. And so we need more in-school mentorship, gun violent prevention programs. We have to refund our uh, parks department. I had my job, I had a job, my first job was at Garfield Community Center. I made $7.25 an hour. Uh, cleaning up garbage, connecting with uh, our neighbors, ensuring that the director there had all the paperwork that she needed. I learned about responsibility. And so one of the biggest things that I would love to bring to our city of Seattle is a youth job portal where you can go on our website for youth jobs to find out which department you can be able to, you know, have these different jobs and activities so you can be able to learn the skills, the work, also bring back the Seattle Vocational Institute, SVI, that is in our district as well for our young people as well. Um, and so we have an array of different plans that are district specific. Alex. Yeah, I'm the mom of a teenager, and so we know this issue really well. The American Pediatric Association said that you know that our te our young people are experiencing severe mental health impacts, both from COVID and and from living in such a very difficult world. So we know we need some some clear solutions here. One of them uh, is obviously we need to have teen centers, teen centers that are open late at night, so that kids have somewhere to go and something to do. We need to increase the amount of summer jobs and city internships that we have we have things you know we have gaps in things like um, you know uh, lifeguards and and these are the kinds of jobs that we can have our young people be doing as they're training into uh, other kinds of, of work in our recreation and in our public sector and I think what we really need to address is is, is this mental health crisis the city is going to pass uh, our, our FEPS levy our, our families education uh, and promise levy next year and one of the ways that we can really invest here is supporting those mental and behavioral health resources inside the school so that we have no less than a one to 250 to student ratio uh, uh, and help kids out. I do want to follow up with one thing before we move on from public safety and it deals with teens. Central District is the home for the Youth Detention Center, which is District 3. There is a push to get rid of that eventually in the coming years, including Dow Constantine, the King County Executive. Do you agree with getting rid of the Youth Detention Center? And this is a detention center that deals only with teens who commit the most violent crimes. Do you support getting rid of that detention center? Joy? Yeah, I'm, I'm on board for that plan. And, and what that means is we could spend $1,500 a year to mentor a kid 
or it's $40,000 to put them in Echo Glen. And so if we can invest in our kids now, particularly at middle school, right, before they get into high school, because they're ripe at the age of vulnerability in middle school, we could set them on pathways that are healthy pathways that keep them out where we don't need the youth detention center anymore. Um, and so that's that's the investment that we want to see. That's a good goal to work towards. And, and I support it wholeheartedly with those investments. Yeah, obviously we do not want to see children in jail and we should always be building towards a society that does better than that. One of the things that we passed in, in April was the crisis care levy, and that is going to have uh, a special crisis center that is just for young people. I think that would be an incredible uh, transition away from basically the school to prison pipeline and towards a, a, a world that invests in our young people and, and creates a pathway to, to them being able to heal and thrive. All right, we're going to move on to um, our next topic here, uh, affordable housing. We'll get a little more deeper into that. Uh, as Seattle has grown, so has the struggle with the housing affordability, as we have already discussed a little bit. Um, this is an obstacle, obviously, for the unhoused. It is one of the major obstacles. A lot of people like to cite other reasons, but if you read study after study, it's the lack of affordable housing that tends to cause this with a lot of people right there on the verge of being homeless. But this is also something that affects a lot of uh, low to middle income um, homeowners as well, trying to hold on to those houses they've had for years. I want you to keep, in that, uh, keep that in mind as Caesar asks you some more questions about affordable housing. Yeah, both of you have listed housing affordability as one of your top three priorities. Uh, according to some estimates, building affordable housing could cost hundreds if not billions of dollars. Who would build that, the housing that is needed and how would it be funded? Joey, why don't we start with you? Could you repeat that? I'm so sorry. Uh, so, uh, according to some estimates, building affordable housing could cost hundreds if not billions of dollars. Who would build that housing that is needed and how would it be funded? Yeah, so our housing crisis, we know um, that we're one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing city uh, in, in America. And people are coming here from all across the country um, to be able to live into the city of Seattle. And so this is not just a city of Seattle issue. This is also a regional issue. This is also, you know, um, a county issue as well. Um, and so when you're talking about different revenue streams, who should build this, who should fund this, who, you know, these are all these great ideas, who, who's going to build this and fund this? Um, we have money. We have money in our budget. We have money in different uh, pathways to be able to build housing. Um, and so when we're thinking about new uh, tax streams, uh, one of them is a CEO tax that we can implement, a high earners tax. There's so many different pathways. We have our MHA. We have all these different ways in which people are able to, to build affordable housing. Um, but we also need to lean on our federal government as well as we're seeing this influx of a uh, population to be able to provide some of those funding gaps for affordable housing. Yeah, I've been working on the issue of affordable housing for a very long time, both as a, as a board member of an organization that works to provide low-income and workforce housing, and as a leader in my neighborhood as we were striving to um, ensure that there was affordable housing being built uh, as we were growing. So we know that there's a couple of ways that we have to do this. As you mentioned, it's quite a daunting task, and the government itself can't take it all on. Um, but there is, of course, a role for the public sector, both in helping to support our, our Office of the Housing, Seattle Housing Authority, um, but also in supporting the Social Housing Initiative, which is a transition towards uh, a permanent supportive housing source. We also need to keep investing in our nonprofit sector through things like our housing levy, which is going to be on your ballot uh, in November and, and helps us to create deeply important investments in the lowest, um, in folks with the lowest incomes at 50% AMI and below. Low. And we're going to have to have the market deliver a lot of this housing as well for, for um, people who can afford market rate and above. But the city has a responsibility to make it faster, easier, and cheaper for that housing to get built so that we can get it as quickly as we need to be able to uh, bend the cost curve here. In the last decade, many community members who lived in the Central District and Black or low-income areas have been pushed out or displaced due to gentrification. White and wealthy neighborhoods have remained largely untouched. Some of that displacement was also caused by new housing developments. How would you balance the need for more housing 
keeping communities together and ensuring more equitable development. Alex, we'll start with you. Yeah, we have seen shameful levels of displacement and gentrification in the Central District and throughout um, South Seattle. And part of that is because, as you mentioned, the wealthy white neighborhoods have been able to successfully prevent additional housing being built in their communities. And that needs to stop. We also need to make sure that we're um, protecting and, and bringing folks back through things like the right of first return, like at the Liberty Bank Project. We need to make sure that we're supporting affordable home ownership, like the program that was passed at the state. We need to be doing automatic enrollment and property tax deferral so elders can have their costs um, get brought down. We need to be investing in maintenance so you don't lose your house because you can't afford a new roof. We need to be also investing in our equitable development initiative, which helps to build um, community around housing. We need to make it so um, so that black developers can, can get in on this too, right? So that black people are not just recipients of housing, but get to build intergenerational wealth through both home ownership and development. Joy. Yeah, this one is really passionate to me um, just because I've seen our neighborhood change uh, significantly in the Central District and been on the, the forefront of trying to ensure that a lot of our neighbors that look like me are able to keep their home um, and be able to age in place and pass it down to generations after generations. Uh, I mentioned before that we turned our house into a triplex to be able to afford uh, affordability. There's a lot of people that want to do that, but they don't know how. They didn't have the funds. They didn't have the technical assistance to be able to do that. And so if we can offer more innovative programming that are able to transition people that can age in place and be able to turn their house into different type of multifamily housing units, that's perfect. We can invest in HomeSite, which creates their Sam Smith program, which allows people, first time home buyers. Uh, Representative Taylor passed a great bill at the state level for people to be able to come back into the central district to purchase homes and it matches uh, your down payment assistance as well. Um, you know, you have your Liberty Bank and you also have Africa Town that's done a phenomenal job of bringing homes and, and people back into the community. So when old houses are torn down to build town, uh, developers typically build townhomes or luxury apartments, people get priced out. What actions would you take to make sure developers build housing that people can actually afford? Alex? People get priced out because we haven't built enough housing and we've allowed for a very cruel game of musical chairs to occur where only people with the highest incomes are able to compete in a market to have their basic human right to a house met. And so um, obviously in, in single family homes there are very few of them that are available for sale for less than a million dollars anymore. So we need to make sure that we are increasing the supply of housing so we're adding more chairs to that game. Uh, so it's, it's really critical, but we can also help our developers bring the costs down by making it faster, easier, and cheaper through that permitting um, and streamlining that I've been talking about. We can uh, incentivize affordability within these new developments with things like expansions of our multifamily tax exemption so that existing buildings can provide up to 3,000 units of affordable housing that are currently locked away. So there's quite a number of solutions here that really involve making sure everybody has a place to live. Joy. Yeah, one of the ways that we can um, be able to create more affordability within our, our district, uh, incentivizing family housing, uh, being able to uh, also incentivize like flats and condos. I know we have a lot of townhomes in our city because we have to build very skinny and very tall, um, but that's not ideal for a lot of families that might have a toddler that are scared about their toddler falling down three flights of stairs or elderly people that cannot go up and down those stairs as well. So incentivizing condos uh, being built. Um, also, besides streamlining the permitting process, this is one thing that's really important that we don't think about is also working with our Seattle Public Utilities and how when developers are able to connect to like a sewer line or the electrical line, how long that takes uh, for folks and the cost in that. And then that's passed on to the buyer or the tenant um, as well. And so all of these are interconnected about affordability. And if we can streamline and make it a little bit quicker, all those costs will not get built into the final, um, the final piece of housing.
I think we could talk about affordable housing for this entire debate and never solve it. There, it's just, there's so much to it, and it is going to take a huge effort. So whichever one of you moves on, you're going to have to work with the city council to try to figure that out, not just for this district, but for this entire city. That said, uh, let's talk a little bit about small businesses. They are the backbone of, of really any big city. Um, Caesar has some questions for you. So many of these uh, small uh, small businesses closed during the pandemic. They shut down permanently. Many are still struggling in many cases because of safety and security issues, going back to public safety. Um, how would you support small businesses in this climate? Uh, Joy? Yeah, one of the ways, look, I'm a small business owner, and so I get it, and one of the most highly regulated industries in the, in, in the state. And so I understand the pain that small businesses have unfortunately gone through during the pandemic. 6,500 small businesses in the city of Seattle either closed or permanently closed during our city. And when we saw all the big businesses run away from downtown and desert downtown, we saw our small businesses holding it down in neighborhoods, ensuring that people had food, their coffee, whether it was daycare. Like these small businesses were literally the backbone of of our city. And so one of the ways is which we can create a safer environment. A lot of small businesses are hiring their own private security to create safe places for their patrons to come in. And so that's an additional cost that is factored into their operational costs. Uh, the second piece is the revitalization of downtown, bringing in our arts, our community, our culture, our small businesses. That's going to be revitalizing our downtown and ensuring that our small businesses are always a part of that plan to create that economic uh, development. Yeah, our small, like here in District 3, one of the things I've learned is that we have the highest concentration of small businesses anywhere in the state of Washington. It's one of the things that makes this such an incredibly special place, and we want to protect that. Of course, we need to have, you know, taking taking care of folks and increasing public safety and, and calming our streets through through the solutions that, that get people uh, connected to better care. We need to figure out how to support our small businesses directly. Obviously, there's a state constitutional amendment that means we can't just provide grants, but we can figure out ways that we can support, especially around property damage. We can incentivize uh, uh, shopping with things like sales tax holidays on special days that make it so that we're um, contributing to that downtown activation. Many small businesses find it difficult to get insurance right now. The city can be very helpful in that. We can provide more technical and material support, especially in language. And uh, we need to take away the incentive to uh, that people get if you leave your business vacant, which is considered a tax write-off, which is not helpful. And I want to ask a question about small businesses. One thing, I want to have a question um, pertaining to small businesses. When you talk to a lot of business owners in Seattle, and not just District 3, they say that they don't get the police response time sometimes to property crimes. And when you look at the numbers right now, we have 937 about that number deployable officers, which is way less, hundreds less than just 10 years ago. So the police department have said we are giving out bonuses, we are doing these campaigns, but for years now, recruitment is not successful. So what would you do differently to draw people to the Seattle Police Department? Alex? Yeah, we need to make sure that we're using our limited police resources effectively so that when you experience a crime that they are focused on that. That means we need to get more ambitious about standing up our, our uh, alternative response model. We've been waiting years for the city to roll this out and they just did last week and there's six people that are staffed in it and a police officer has to come first so it's not alleviating the pressure, it's just contributing to it. So if we can make it so that we have like, like Kirkland and Albuquerque, people who are able to respond to the almost 40% of calls, which are for mental or behavioral health issues, then we're going to free up our police resources to focus on things like property and violent crime. We need to, and as we're doing that, I think that will have a, a recruiting effect to it. We need to have reform in our police department so that our police officers are acting always impeccably with the highest level of professional standards. That will help to recruit police officers. And and we need to be showing people that we are serious about these solutions that are built around progressive values but are effective so that folks know that they're not going to have to show up to work solving the same problem over and over and over again. Joy. 
police accountability is like number one, right? Police accountability and transparency. But I also believe that the tone of the council needs to change and it needs to shift. And while, while, that, changes, applause, please. Thank while you. that changes and shifts, um, I'm hoping that that will be able to attract a different type of officer, a different type of uh, culture, not talking about you know warriors. We're talking about guardians, right? Like that is a different. It's a different shift. And um, my time is up, and that's my answer. Thank I'm going to give you a few more seconds because Alex had an extra 30 seconds. So go ahead. We also need to support before the badge program. It's a program where people get connected to communities uh, before they're in crisis. So they connect with the black community, whether it's the South End community, LGBTQIA community, and they engage in the recruits before they get before they get into the program before the badge. They engage in these in these communities, which is important because they're engaging with them before they're in crisis. So they get to know the person before they're engaging with them so they know how to de-escalate certain things. I'm going to jump in here and ask one more follow-up because this is a, this is a big topic and I, I, you each get 30 seconds to answer this. Uh, we have the time to do it. How do you get police officers to come work in a place where they don't feel like they're wanted? Go ahead. Yeah, well, one, I talk about the tone of the council, but I think what's really important, too, is amplifying voices that are severely impacted by when we take certain policing out of communities, right? They're impacted significantly higher because what you want for your neighborhood might be different for what a neighborhood actually needs. And so I want to amplify those voices who have been screaming, who have been shouting, who have been pledging for positive relationships with our department and ensuring that, uh, you know, that they understand that there are some people that want a certain type of relationship with them. Alex? Yeah, I think we need to bring back our beat cop model right now. Far too many of our, um, of our police officers are spending their time in their cars and that makes it really hard to get to build those trusting relationships with the small business owners with neighborhood stakeholders with residents so that we can begin that that really important process of building trust between community and police we can also be helping with things like you know creating more uh, community oversight programs that are all helpful in um, and forging those relationships so that police officers are, are serving and protecting protecting their community, which of course I believe the vast majority of them are, are trying to do. We want to move on to transportation for a second. So if you were a council member, what is the very first transit policy that you would sponsor if you got that seat and be very specific? Joy, I would like to start with you. Yeah, for me, it's about public safety. Like, you know, um, we have phenomenal transportation options in our district. Um, I know that other districts are not as fortunate as us in our district, uh, you know, District 2, or it's really difficult to travel between east and west uh, in our city. But one of the things, and we've been piecemealing a lot of the transportation stuff going on in our city, whether it's from Sound Transit to our, uh, you know, metro rapid rides to different um, pieces. But for me specifically, uh, we would make it more affordable for a lot of the bus drivers and a lot of the service operators and maintenance workers to be able to afford to live in our city with workforce housing so they can be able, we don't have, you know, those missing ghost buses, but we have a lot of opportunities for, for uh, the people that are operating them. Yeah, my family lives without a car, and I have spent over five years uh, as a leader in transportation policy here in the state of Washington, and I've helped to lead a very uh, significant and progressive investments in making transit better for the 30% of people in our state who can't or don't drive. One thing we need to be really clear about here and what the city can do is increase transit reliability. The Route 8 goes through our district, and it is one of the top 10 busiest routes in the city of Seattle and it has the lowest reliability. That means that every time our taxpayer dollars are going into an hour of service that's getting stuck in traffic, we are taking people's time, we are driving people away from transit, and we are making it so that you can't count on that ride. So I want to see us be allocating more of our right away to be increasing transit reliability so that we can meet our climate goals, we can meet our mobility goals, and we can uh, address uh, people's basic affordability. If we want to spend a lot of money on these programs, though, first, people need to use it. When you look at a lot of the buses, it's empty right now. Even light rail, you don't, it's not at capacity. How do you convince people to get out of their cars and use public transit in the first place right now? 
So I'm on public transit every day and I am never alone on public transit. Over half a million people ride public transit in our county every day. And right now those people are experiencing a lack of reliability. They are having ghost bus not show up. They are experiencing a lack of rider dignity. We don't have safe and clean stations. We don't have basic bathrooms for people to be able to make transit a usable choice for so many of us. Uh, and we don't have the assurance that transit is going to get us where we need to go. Troy? Yeah, we have to make it safe for people to feel like they would love to ride, ride transit. I know I have a mom who would love to ride transit, but she does not feel safe. There's a lot of people that would love to ride transit. They talk about it all the time, but they don't feel safe. And so if we can create a sense of safety on our buses, we've seen what happened at the Beacon Hill light rail station. We've seen what happened over in West Seattle. People do not feel safe. And so we have to make it safe for people to be able to uh, jump on transit and, and especially our, our, our vulnerable communities. So the good news here is you're two-thirds of the way through this. We're counting down very quickly, so it, you guys are doing a great job. Uh, we're going to tackle a couple of the hyper-local district questions that some of the attendees here. Uh, we had quite a few. Some of them doubled on, on kind of what we were already asking. Uh, Hannah has the first one, followed by Caesar. So this is from one District 3 voter, and that person says, I look at the surrounding streets around Puget Sound, and I see their quality is much higher than ours. Is there something that can be done to go fix the streets and remove all of those potholes? Alex. <laughs> <laughs> never have to have a competitive election again if you could figure that one out. I ride my bicycle around all the time, so I feel the, the, the jarringness of our unmaintained roads just as much as anybody. The city is going to have seven months to pass a Move Seattle levy, which is a major investment in our transportation infrastructure. It's maintenance and operation, and that's going to be on your ballot in November of 2024. So your city council is going to have seven months to figure out how we do a decade worth of investments in our right of way to make it uh, safe, reliable, and well-maintained. That, of course, does include the ability to make sure that our roads and streets are, of course, safe for people um, and that they are well-maintained so that we can increase the basic mobility of people regardless of what mode you're in. Yeah, some of the, the basic infrastructure of our city, as we have continued to grow, to grow, has been neglected. And so, you know, you're looking at crosswalks next to schools that need to be well lit. We're looking at uh, other crosswalks that need to be repainted, uh, the potholes that are going on in our city, and just the basic day-to-day -day infrastructure within our city, from the widening of our sidewalks to the, the lights. Look, I knew about our corner. I live on the corner of 23rd and John, and we saw accidents every single day. Day, one day a month for the last five five years and I pointed a camera and I was able to uh, make that corner safer just by showing the amount of accidents that were happening just basic infrastructure in our city it took me five years with a camera which it shouldn't have but however you know that goes to show you about as we have increased and grown as a city we cannot forget our water our sewer our garbage all the things that are the infrastructure in our city uh, to be able to grow as well with uh, our population growth uh, the city of Seattle is well known for innovation in the areas of early learning, child care, including after school care. What is being done right and what more is needed? Alex? Yeah, we've created obviously two really exciting programs. We have our, 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 our Families Education and, and Promise Levy that I discussed earlier, that does create investments for low-income families uh, and direct financial assistance in finding affordable childcare. We also have created an amazing program, the Seattle Promise, which many students right here at Seattle College uh, are able to benefit from, which provides uh, guaranteed tuition for graduates from our Seattle public school system. So these are things that we are, are definitely doing well. But the cost of childcare has gotten totally out of control. And so we need to take a look at how we're making it easier to site childcare facilities, how we're um, subsidizing and investing so that working families aren't paying the equivalent of a second mortgage in childcare. And we need to close the gap between where the, where the childcare is and where people need to go. This is back to kind of how do we have that, those walkable cities where your job, your home, your transit are, are all really well and easily connected. Yeah, child care is a public good that is funded by parents right now, working class families. And 
we have to start treating it like a public good because if you don't have childcare, you cannot go to work. If you don't have childcare, you cannot perform certain activities. Those kids are getting educated in these early learning environments. And even though the school, the school, the uh, city council is not the school board, so they do not deal with curriculum. They do with all the infrastructure around, you know, schools and early learning uh, childcare. And so one of the things that we have to do, um, I worked at an after school program, and if a parent dropped their kid off at 7 a.m., we would come pick their kid up at 3 p.m., they would get fed, they would also get um, basketball training, and then they would have bas uh, tr practice, and that parent would pick them up at 8 p.m. That is a form of childcare. We can have different ac activities and nonprofit programs that help with being able to get kids something to do after school, particularly, that is also a form of childcare. We have one police question, specifically police accountability. So as a city council member, you will have the authority to weigh in on SPA contracts, which as we know, as in the Seattle Police Union contracts, would you change or add anything to an upcoming contract when it specifically comes to holding police officers accountable? And Joy, let's start, Joy, let's start with you. Yeah, so one of the ways in which, um, one of the ways in which it's important as we are rebuilding our police department and we are recruiting new officers is that we also have a high lens of accountability and transparency literally at every level, especially a department where they are granted the access to take a life if needed. Um, and so one of the ways in which uh, in a new contract is to subpoena power for our city council. Uh, the second way is to ensure that they have a certain amount of hours that they are required to be able to spend in community creating relationships with a lot of the, the communities that have been impacted uh, by, by policing, um, which is important and not just relying on people to show up, but they are required to be in there as well. Um, and so all these, all these measures, there's also um, a call in different communities where they're saying, hey, we also want a, a civilian oversight, ensuring that we can be able to um, ensure that you know, there's accountability and transparency. There's so many different pathways, uh, but those would be the two main ones. Alex? Yeah, we need to, of course, increase the ratios of our Civilian Oversight Board, our Office of Police Accountability right now allows for uh, quite a significant number of uniformed police officers to be sitting on those accountability boards, and, and that creates pressure to be able to really you know, not move forward the way that we want. So we need to be able to move that. We need to in increase, of course, the subpoena power so that officers, the very few of them who are uh, doing misconduct can be held be held accountable to the highest level of professional standard and decorum that we taxpayers expect. We need to, um, in the contract, be clear about the scope of work. We've talked a lot about the police alternatives. That is going to require some, some, um, some contract changes, and so we need to be able to say, like, this scope of work is best met by alternative response, and, and that comes to bear in our contract, as well as uh, some of the, the things that we do around overtime, right? We know that we spend $30 million in overtime every year. We need to make an adjustment there. All right. All right. We're going to try something a little bit different that they didn't have a chance for in the last debate. Uh, it's called our lightning round. Uh, we're going to basically ask you a round of yes or no questions. You already know the drill. You've been, it's basically, it looks like this. Thumbs down, no. Thumbs up, yes. It's real simple. It's nice and visual. Uh, you have been given the paddles. We're just going to ask you a handful of these. Uh, I'm going to start right now. Seattle a City Council recently voted to prosecute some drug crimes as gross misdemeanors. Would you have voted for that drug law, yes or no? You are running for the seat that longtime council member Shama Sawant is leaving. Do you believe your policies, for the most part, align with hers? Yes or no? Is there a waffle? Yeah. <laughs> no. Nope. Okay. Where do you lean more towards? Do you support defunding the police? Yes or no? All right, would you support an NBA team to call Seattle home again, yes or no? <laughs> would you favor a crackdown on habitual shoplifters, yes or no? Do you support turning office buildings into residences to reduce homelessness, yes or no? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. 
Thanks. Do you support turning office buildings into residences to reduce yeah, yeah. homelessness? All right. Do you support rent control? Get some waffles there. <laughs> that was the idea. Go ahead. Do you think the King County Regional Homelessness Authority is doing an effective job in fighting homelessness? Yes or no? All right, one last question. Do you support an income tax? All right, there. Perfect timing. Love it. Uh, and with that, our time is up. So uh, we are now going to give our candidates uh, 60 seconds each for a closing statement. And Joy, we're going to begin with you. Oh, I'm sorry, Joy, you went first, so we're going to begin with Alex this time. Sorry. You have 60 seconds, go ahead. Okay, yeah, um, I'm Alex Hudson, and I am a progressive leader with a long track record of bringing people together to find solutions to our greatest problems that are already making people's lives better. I love this city and I love this district, which is why I've dedicated my life and my career to making it be a better place. And I know that a better future is possible if we come together with the effective coalition building and the experienced leadership to make it so that everyone has a safe, affordable place to live, that no one sleeps on our streets, that we are providing people with effective solutions based on progressive values. It is possible to have uh, a Seattle that meets our needs, that is safe, that is thriving, where our children have opportunity and where our old people can rest, and we are all able to be very deeply proud to call Seattle our home. Go ahead. Community, culture, commerce. That was the Seattle I know, and that's the one I grew up with. And as we are trying to figure out who we want to be in the identity and who for, we have to start getting real about public safety. We have to start to get real about our housing affordability. We have to start getting real about our response to homelessness. We have to ensure that our kids can play safely at the park, that we invest in their after school program, that we are a city for working class families who built this city off their backs from day-to-day -day operators to bus drivers to the artists that we used to have home here on Capitol Hill. What type of city do we want to be in the future? And that's what's on the line today for this important election for District 3. I hope tonight you have seen I have earned your vote and your trust to help represent you for Seattle City Council District 3. I'm Joy Hollingsworth. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, a couple, we're on a quite quick timeline here because this is live right now, so I've got to hit a clock. Uh, with that, we do end our District 3 debate. You can both take a big, deep breath. You did a great job tonight. Uh, we hope everybody learned something from this, and we hope you will obviously get out and vote. And if you're not registered yet or need to update your information, it's not too late. Just go to votewhat.gov for more information. Make sure your ballot is postmarked by Tuesday, November 8th, or drop it in the ballot drop box by 8 p.m. on Election Day. And the Seattle City Club is also organizing debates for the races in District 4 and 5, so you can see the details there on your screen. And you can find more information always at seattlecityclub.org. And for now, we say goodbye from South Seattle College. A big thank you to our audience. Mostly, a little extra applause in there, but to our candidates. First time that either of them has done that. So a big, oh, this is the time. You can applaud. And with that, thank you and good night. And there it is. The debate for District 3 is now in the books as Joy Hollingsworth and Alex Hudson squared off to see who is a better candidate to lead Seattle City Council District 3. That seat is being vacated by Seattle City Council Member Shama Sawant. Now, don't forget to tune into all of the other debates this Thursday. Candidates will be for District 4 for that seat will square off at UW. And on October the 17th, District 5 candidates will be meeting at North Seattle College. All of those debates will air on Fox 13 Plus at 7 p.m. 
You can also send us any questions that you want to ask these candidates by emailing us at fox13tips at fox.com. Again, we want to make, encourage you to send in some of those questions. If you missed any part of the debate, we'll post the entire thing for you, along with on the Connected TV app, along with political roundtables, answering some of your biggest questions ahead of this upcoming election in just a couple of weeks. Fox Local app is free to download on Fire TV, on Apple TV, Android TV, or Roku. Thanks again so much for joining us tonight. Have a great night and make sure you don't forget to vote. For more details, make sure to visit our website at fox13seattle.com. We'll see you right back here at 9 o'clock for their Fox 13 News at 9.